This is the year of robots. And over the past year, we filmed so many robots. Industrial arms welding steel, humanoids walking, climbing, and lifting. But one kind of robot has been missing. Small, cheap, programmable robots. At first glance, these little guys can seem, well, kind of useless. They're not building cars or hauling freight. They're not folding your laundry. So what's the point? To answer that, let's rewind. In the 1970s, the counterculture is booming, and America has just gone to the moon using the computing power of a modern calculator. But in California, a small group of dreamers are getting excited about computers. Not the people crunching numbers for NASA, but the machines themselves. Big, expensive machines reserved for corporations and government labs. Then, in 1975, two Steves in a garage asked a radical question. What if computers weren't just for businesses? What if they were personal? What if anyone could program one? create software, build useful or just fun applications. That was Apple's vision. And in many ways, that's a Nate's vision for robotics today. While companies like Tesla chase humanoids for factory floors and warehouses, Nate is thinking smaller and more personal. And the first robot is called Mars. Right out of the box, you can talk to Mars in plain language. Mars, clean the kitchen. It listens, thinks, and tries. It's magical, like giving instructions to a curious apprentice. And if you want to go deeper, a Nate's programming environment lets you drop in a natural language basic or even full Python. You can be as simple or as technical as you want. The goal isn't just functionality, it's experimentation. It's about building in your garage with friends, showing Mars off at a party, shaking hands, writing custom code, even modifying its appearance and hardware. Of course, robotics isn't all magic. It's one of the hardest frontiers in technology, and the challenges run deep. In the 1980s, Hans Moravec noted something strange. Robots can easily lift a car, but struggle to pick up a random toy from the floor. What's effortless for humans, grasping, balancing, and perceiving, turns out to be devilishly hard for machines. This is more of X paradox, and it's one of the key bottlenecks holding back industrial robotics today. Most industrial robots are masters of repetition. Pick and place, pick this part up, place it here. But change that part slightly or shift the environment, and they often fail. Software is the bottleneck. Perception is hard, control is fragile, and the messy physics of the real world is unforgiving. That's why so many robots from factory arms to humanoids still use simple parallel grippers, two fingers moving in and out to grip an object. It's not elegant, but it's reliable. A reminder that even after decades, the simplest design often wins. The holy grail isn't just raw strength or perfect code, it's physical intelligence. The ability to move in an uncertain world with grace, adaptability, and common sense. That's why even tasks as basic as stacking boxes or playing chess with real pieces push the limits of robotics. The software must not only think, but feel the physics in real time and correct mistakes. And that's what makes small personal robots important. They're not just toys, they're test beds. Every experiment, every hack, every creative use pushes the field closer to solving the hardest problem of all, giving machines real world intelligence. 2025 isn't just the year of humanoids stepping into the world. It's also the year that personal robotics takes root. Little robots for your desk. Robots that you can hack, program, and make your own. I've always wanted to do something something different and very impactful. When I was at Stanford, I was a researcher in human-computer interaction. So I was a lot more interested in like the relationship between people and technology and how could we get a healthier relationship with, with technology in that sense. I think there are so many interesting things that you can do with technology these days and that if you use that technology properly and you build something nice with it, you're going to allow other people to potentially make a lot of new useful things. Great. Yeah, that was great. Mars is the first personal AI robot. It's more than a robot. It's, it's really a platform for everyone to build on. It's the first thing that you can receive at home and turn immediately into something that you want it to be with a personality, with a memory, with, with new use cases that are easily programmable so that you at home can make it do whatever you want. So we want to be the first ones to bring this technology to people and, and show them this is what we think a truly intelligent robot that thinks with you, this is what it's going to look like in your home. Axel was really adamant about wanting to show all of the capabilities the robot has. That's why I'm standing in the bathroom. In the scene, we have our main guy. He's going to pop his collar, look to the robot. He'll be right there and give him a nod to let him know he's ready. So I think on action, you'll be looking like this. You're just kind of like, Okay. Put yourself in the mirror, and then and then you'll when he looks to you, you'll kind of give him a like nod, like yeah, you look good, dude. Alrighty, shall we? 
But we want to show him doing everything from helping around the house, picking up socks, to playing chess, showing them off to your friends, taking pictures of your plant, and letting you know if it's healthy or not. And that was kind of the goal of this ad, is to show all of the useful use cases, as well as the fun and the programmatic ones. People have been trying to make chess playing robot for a very long time. And so far, it hasn't really worked. It's, it's incredible how something that seems as simple needs so many different parts to come together in order to work. You need to estimate the state of the chessboard, where are the pieces, what is the next move I should do, how do I move the piece. All of these are different components of the system that are not simple to do. Knowing what is the next piece to move, this has been solved for like 25 years now. The computer actually knows how to play chess. Moving the piece itself, so far, there's no real robot that can do that yet. But with the new paradigm that we have created, it's actually pretty simple. And we have created a system in which it very seamlessly plugs inside the brain of the computer to know what the, the next move is going to be. So we can do this with chess. We can probably do it with a lot of other games, actually. Right now, we're getting ready to film Mars in a car. We got this lovely car rig from Matthew's Grip. And hopefully, we don't break the camera. That's going to be secure. I do love this like just simple shot of the, of the camera looking into the car. You have a character, in this case a robot, looking up in a very inspired way. I've done so many different things and I think the best thing you can do is make, make something that everyone's going to use that makes their lives better. Never in history could you get a robot at home that you can just type your prompt, your system prompt and tell it what to do and get it to immediately do that thing. And the last time this happened was for PCs in 1975. And we all know the revolution that happened after this. It was really important for us in this ad to capture the early Silicon Valley building in a garage days of so many great companies. This isn't a set, this is Nate's actual garage where they built and prototype Mars as well as other robots. There's always been something mythic about Silicon Valley, at least in my opinion. A couple houses from here is where Facebook was developed right after they left Harvard. Uh, the HP garage is somewhere over there, where Apple was founded is also obviously over there. Silicon Valley has a lot of creative technical people. I wanted to move here for a long time because this is where you're going to have the most impact. And just all the dreamers here. Like, you really need people who are going to feel the potential behind something like this technology. And the best ones are dreamers, and they only come here. This is what early innovation and greatness feels like. It feels like being in a small warehouse, an apartment or a garage with your friends and your co-founders, working and hacking on stuff that you're passionate about. It doesn't always have to start with a huge, huge, huge vision. Sometimes it can just start with you focused in a garage, trying to build something that you want to see in the world. I really live by that principle of like, the best thing you can do for humanity is try to bring a novel contribution. And the best way to do it is by putting something out there that a lot of people are going to use that would not have existed if I was not there. The story of technology has always been, in my opinion, about how new technologies enable us to do more and to be more creative, about how can we enlarge the creative space of what you can do and the capabilities, the physical capabilities that these robots can do. It's really about being creative and wanting to make something different, something new that is really going to change how the world works. Thanks for watching this video. Check out the main ad if you haven't seen it yet. Let us know what you think. As always, till next time, keep on building the future. Thank you.